Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you all for coming uh, to uh, this roundtable discussion and being part of our larger conversation as the Interdisciplinary Research Institute for the Study of Inequalities uh, day of, of, of thinking about climate justice and having a series of teach-ins and, and conversations around that work. My name is Tom Romero. Uh, I am the faculty director of IRISE. Um, how many of you know about IRISE, heard of IRISE? Just a few people, all right, that's good because I wanna share um, a little bit of our work. We're committed to supporting community-based organizations that are working towards social justice. Creating healing justice initiatives that take the whole person in order to achieve social justice, in order to organize for social justice, in order to fight for social justice and win for social justice, you have to be able to show up to the fight as a whole person. IRISE simply is a hub to bring together the resources of the University of Denver to engage with community partners around some of the most intractable problems of racial injustice in our society. We had these multiple pandemics come together, uh, certainly the, the pandemic of COVID-19 and the biological pandemic, the pandemic of climate change, and of course the pandemic of racial violence and institutional racism. In terms of intersectionality, that means we need to understand not just race, but issues like gender, issues like uh, poverty, issues like sexuality, issues like disability, in order for us to more precisely understand the nature of the issues. And then when it comes to interdisciplinary work, what this means is that we need a team of researchers. We need a team of collaborators that are able to look at these problems from a variety of different perspectives, a variety of different disciplinary backgrounds and trainings and methodologies, so we can collectively arrive at the, the, the right prescription, the right prognosis. I get the sense when I speak to IRI's faculty that they care about uh, mentoring me in terms of my career and wanting to support me in whatever it is that I want to do but you know also that they care about me as a human being really cares about um, not just the ideology of racial justice but the practice and how faculty and students and staff and you know postdocs treat each other is is very important because a lot of times I have experienced a disconnect between those two what people study what they read uh, what they research and how they treat each other and I think that if you want to really fight for racial justice, you actually have to do it all and still care both in the institution and also in just the interactions between everyday people. The future of iRISE, I think, is focused both short-term and long-term. One is we hope to continue to share the data that our faculty, our students, our community partners are continuing to collect in our variety of projects. To share that data and then begin to work with those that are in positions of power to begin to make meaningful, substantive change. Keep in mind that the rules are made to keep us from getting into these spaces. And so we had to break some rules to get into this space and lean into drama. I think our primary blind spot is um, defensiveness and fear. And I think a lot of, uh, a lot of times People respond with defensiveness and fear, fear of being accused of, of being biased or fear that their environment is being accused of being biased and, and people feel shame. But the aim of this type of research is not to make people feel shame or fear. The aim of this research is to make us better, to make our society better and so that we could live with integrity, knowing that we are doing our best to approach justice in our environment. 
I think what universities can continue to do is create spaces where they amplify the voices of their students. They pay attention to what young people need and, and make sure that we use those resources to provide those things for, for our students, to protect our students, you know, no matter what that looks like. And understand that some of this is going to be really uncomfortable. That hopefully gives you a little sense of, of who we are in terms of an institute. We're coming up on our 10 years of being in, in existence at the University of Denver. One of the things that, that as someone who was born and raised in Denver, like Ian Thomas DeFoya, who you heard earlier, um, that I can tell you about the University of Denver is that even though we don't have a literal gate around this university, we have a figurative one, right? Um, it's a gated community in many ways. And the work of iRISE is to destroy that gate, right? Is to connect more meaningfully the work, the scholarship, the teaching, the learning, learning that you are doing as students, the scholarship that faculty are doing, the engagement with community partners, right? That, are, that should be driving our work, our vision. Uh, we are a private university committed to the public good, right? And iRISE is a way for that to happen. So, we have a variety of different projects that we support. We have a variety of different projects that are engaged in the community. Uh, there's a social movement support lab that is working in particular with community organizations all over the country on the school to prison pipeline. One of the things that you, you saw in this video is uh, their work around defund data and, and the ways that, um, that they are tracking and monitoring how, how much money is going into local governments. Um, th that is going to things like police as opposed to education or healthcare. Um, tied to this day and, and tied to the larger uh, conversation around climate justice and environmental justice, uh, there's a project that I am, I am privileged to help lead and, and be in partner with, with faculty all over campus. It's called the Color of Water in Colorado Project, in which we are trying to, to identify and understand much more precisely the way that our water infrastructure, our water rights, we're a headwater state, as, as Ian pointed here, out here today, is connected to a, a system of racial inequality. And so that's another example of some of the work that we're doing. Um, so I encourage all of you, it sounds like a lot of you don't know about the work of iRISE, please engage with us, um, bookmark our website, come find out there's ways to, we, we hire um, our, our projects that we support, we hire students, uh, we connect people to community, um, and I want to certainly point out we have community partners that are here today uh, that, that we want to make sure that we, we are engaging and supporting their work. Um, I was also point out too that there is a QR code that you can also uh, take your phone and um, scan, and I think those are outside the doors or, or at the tables as well. Um, I also uh, want to start out and, and also just point out in terms of our work and our values. Um, I always want to take the time, just as I said, to so in some ways we're a private university, we're a gated university in many ways. We, this is such a privilege to be here, to be in this space, right? It's, uh, every day I come to work here at the University of Denver, whether I've done it in person or virtually, I, you know, I have had economic security, I have had web security, I get to talk and, and engage in, in this type of, of space. So I just want to acknowledge all those that give us the privilege to work here. There's the maintenance staff, there's the facilities crew, right, that are here every day. We don't get to see it, right? They're the ones that are cleaning up. Um, our food here today is not provided by Sodexo. Uh, we work with community partners and we work with communities of color um, as caterers uh, to support their work. So anytime our resources are being used, they're done in ways to amplify and enhance the community, right? So just want to acknowledge all those people that give us the privilege to eat and be here and be in community with one another. All right, um, without further ado, I will do a couple things. Um, just wanted to reground us within the context of, of this day and this teach-in. So we started out uh, with our first teach-in this morning uh, with Ian Thomas DeFoy of Green Latinos and, and the Environmental Justice Task Force um, to really sort of 
give us ideas and thoughts about how you can specifically engage, right, in environmental justice work, right? And in many ways, and, and some of the things that you're gonna hear today, these are personal stories that connect to much larger movements and pieces. We are going to turn uh, to a round table and a dialogue uh, with our three experts. Two of them are our, our teaching experts, Ian Thomas Tafoya, who you met to, to, uh, earlier today of Green Latinos, um, Dr. Nadia Kim, uh, who will be teaching our second uh, teach-in at, at three o'clock today, uh, who is the author of Refusing Death, Immigrant Women and the Fight for Environmental Justice in, in Los Angeles. Uh, she'll also be giving a book talk uh, tomorrow at Tattered Cover uh, on that book. And then uh, uh, our third pa panelist in discussion today uh, as part of our round table is someone who I was thrilled to learn that we at the University of Denver hired almost a year ago uh, to the day, uh, Dr. Linda Mendez Barrientos, uh, who's an associate professor in our Corbell School of International Relations. Assistant, did I say associate? I call you full professor, we'll give you full professor. <laughs> <laughs> right off the bat, why don't you have tenure, right? So um, these hierarchies, right, are, you know, are meaningful in this space, but they're not meaningful here, right? We, we try to flatten uh, the conversation. We try to question how power works. I know there are students here. I know there are faculty here. I know there are staff here, but we are all here together in community. We're here to learn. We are here to challenge. We are here to, to hopefully take what, what we're talking about and doing today and certainly put it in, in places where we can transform. And so, um, so without further ado, let me invite our roundtable uh, experts uh, to uh, up front. Um, the, the context of the next, a uh, little bit over an hour, we're gonna go to about two, maybe a few minutes afterwards, is really uh, revolving around something that we, as we started to plan and, and think about this dialogue um, and what climate justice means more broadly, what environmental justice means more specifically, is to link together um, other sorts of issues. And, and most importantly, for the purpose of this dialogue, is the connection between climate change and migration and how that becomes a, a, an issue and a story, an important lens in which to understand the larger climate justice or environmental justice struggle. Um, so I will uh, start us off and uh, with Dr. Kim as, as our, as to, to get us started. Can you guys hear me? Oh, okay, okay. Thank you so much for having me. I just wanna thank uh, Dr. Tom Romero, Marissa Cliff, iRise, I'm, I'm so honored to be here. Um, and uh, my panelists, my co-panelists, I'm excited for our discussion. Um, what I want to do today is I'm going to be speaking about this in much more detail at the three o'clock teaching. So I'm just going to give a little bit of an overview of what I've done. Um, what I did was a thank you. Oh, perfect. Um, I conducted a research study. It took me about um, three and a half, almost four years in Los Angeles. Uh, I did an ethnography, meaning that I immersed myself in the community and the social movements. Uh, fighting environmental racism and classism in Los Angeles. Um, and <clears throat> I really wanted to understand how the actors that many of us don't know about and are not considered the glitterati of Los Angeles by any means. When we think of LA, we think of Kim K or you know, we lionize Kobe Bryant or whatever, but you know, these um, <clears throat> people of color, women of color in particular, women and mothers, right? Many of whom are immigrant. Um, who are at the forefront of these uh, grassroots community movements to clean the air, not just for their communities. Um, you know, as Ian was mentioning earlier in his teaching, you know, polluted by oil refineries, uh, polluted by diesel coming off of the goods movement apparatus. So I'm gonna talk about that in a second, but that goods movement apparatus includes ships, it includes trains, it includes trucks, all that run on diesel, right? Um, and so they're at the forefront of this movement and cleaning the air, not just for their communities, but for all of us. And in the process, also dealing with issues of climate justice, especially for these either immigrant and or of color and or low income working class communities, okay? So let me just, um, what I wanted to do is just kind of give a little bit of a brief overview if I can get this to work. 
Yeah, so I want to just talk a little bit about why does this matter, okay? Um, and if, if there's anything that's missing or you don't understand what I'm saying, then I'm happy to do that in the broader discussion or at the Q Connect 3, okay? But one thing we need to understand is that if we are interested in issues of race and racism, there is no understanding of racism without centering environmental racism, okay? Um, as Ian and as this conversation, and I'm sure you're learning in your classes or in the news, is pointing to is that um, if we don't center the issue of environmental racism, we actually are not fully understanding how white supremacy operates, okay? If we don't fully understand that, then we're not gonna fully be able to try to undo it, right, or unravel it. Um, there's no classism, there's no understanding of class injustice without centering environmental classism, okay? So understanding this, uh, these two parts, right, these two prongs, help us fully grasp what climate justice is. And I just like, you know, to quote the R&B theorist Beyonce to say we need to ring the alarm if we're not recognizing how uh, urgent the issue of climate justice is and, and the need to be active, okay? And these immigrant women I studied definitely give us uh, lessons and pointers, okay? Um, I'm not sure why this is not working. Do I have to point it this way? Or what am I pointing it at? Oh, here we go, it, something's coming, something's happening. <laughs> or maybe not, I don't know. Okay, let me just, if this isn't gonna work, let me just summarize uh, what else I say here. So another way in which we need to understand how uh, racism needs to connect to environmental racism, thank you, Marissa, <coughs> is that we need to be putting the spotlight on neoliberalism and neoliberal racial capitalism. Um, and I know this is a long phrase and it seems kind of sophisticated and fancy, but it's really not, okay? The main thing that we need to understand about neoliberalism is that we used to be a country of liberalism, okay? Starting in the 1980s, we moved to a system of neoliberalism. And essentially what that means is that Industry, corporate America, and Wall Street are favored even more than they were in the past. That they're allowed to basically run away with their profiteering and their greed, which, is, which often hinges on uh, enacting racism, structural racism or racist policies against people of color and immigrants, and here's why. One of the reasons why is because Essentially what neoliberalism does by favoring industry and, and the banks so much is that it decides that we don't need a social security, we don't need the social welfare state, we don't need a social safety net, okay? Let the market dictate everything, including whether you have money for retirement, whether you have health care when you're older, okay? whether there's public housing, right? whether there's well-funded public education. Uh, just let the market dictate that, and if people do well and succeed, or if they don't, that all rests on the individual. It's the individual's talent or the individual's fault, okay? So given that, you know, racial capitalism is set up to ultimately favor um, a, a very small minority, 1% of usually white American male elite, right, um, that all those programs, social welfare programs, including you know, social uh, security and Medicare and all that uh, being gutted affects even harsh, more harshly people of color, women of color, um, and immigrants, okay? And as you know, we are now living in an era of very heightened anti-immigrant nationalism, right? We are a white country. White nationalism is where we should be. You know, get all the people of color out or deport them or don't let the ones in from the quote unquote shithole country, okay? So, um, you know, there is this violence and neglect that happens through neoliberal racial capitalism. Um, but as a result of that, and this is something that we need to focus on, which is the empowering news, the positive news, the bottom up change often comes from, you know, immigrants and immigrant mothers and women, people that we don't necessarily pay attention to or think could be these major political change makers. And many of them are unauthorized, okay? So um, we often think, oh, unauthorized immigrants, they're not making political waves or changing the system because they can't vote, they can't participate in the electoral system. That's absolutely false, okay? Many of them are making changes outside of the formal electoral system by organizing their neighbors, right? Knocking on the doors of their fellow 
residents, of going to laundromats, of speaking through the schools, and, and just getting people to recognize, no, your child is not asthmatic because that's some genetic component or some individual wrong that you committed in raising them. No, it's because of the socio-historical you know, issue we want to teach you about called environmental racism and environmental classism under this very neglectful and violent system of neoliberal racial capitalism, okay? So I don't want to go on and on too much, but you know, uh, one of the things that I think is important to point out is that you know, because many of these immigrant mothers, women, and others are no longer uh, feeling the need to be connected to the electoral system or mainstream politics, again, they're unauthorized, many of them, right? It goes to show that as part of this discussion of and an fighting environmental racism and fighting environmental classism, we need to uh, you know, really take heed of the broader debate right, within the environmental justice activist community, that some activists are completely detaching themselves from trying to convince the state okay, and trying to engage in formal politics. Because they've tried for decades and they've not won victories, they might write up a piece of legislation, it won't get enforced, right? And instead, they're focusing on creating their own communities, their communities that are self-determined. They grow their own food through urban farms, right? They form their own schools that teach social justice and progressive politics, not Christopher Columbus and all the presidents, right? Um, they form their own um, social protection as a community that doesn't need to rely on the police, right, as, as Tom Romero was saying. And so the women that I studied are really increasingly moving in that direction, okay? Finally, why does this matter? Um, COVID-19. Right? Like, we can't even understand the pandemic without understanding environmental racism and classism. Because why is it that Pacific Islanders, Black, Latinx, and Indigenous communities are the ones that contracted the highest rates of COVID-19 and died disproportionately from it? Well, that's because their bodies were already compromised because they faced disproportionate environmental pollution. Okay, so we can't even, that's what I mean by, if we don't understand environmental racism, then we're not fully understanding racism, even as it plays out via the pandemic. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> All right, so I, I wanna introduce myself, and I, but any baseball fans here? I did like a um, double play, play. <laughs> I'm gonna introduce myself by talking about my work. So we're gonna do two things at a time. So, who was there but had no one in front of them? Perfect. Uh, thank you, Tom, for the invitation. Thanks for you know, my panelists, uh, great, super excited to meet you and learn more about your work. So I'm a new faculty member here at DU. Uh, I work for the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies and I'm also affiliated with IRIS. And um, my work is about public policy. And I've been working on this project on trying to understand reforms and why they do not necessarily uh, accrue the benefits or the expectations when we design them. So a little bit about me, um, I'm from Nicaragua. I was born at, at the end of the Nicaraguan Revolution when um, we basically, you know, there was this dream that we were gonna, uh, you know, restructure, reorganize our country. We had been, we had, it was after we had 30 years of dictatorship, so it was like, it was seen as a new opportunity to basically work on this social project that was gonna reorganize you know, different outcomes um, and basically democratize access to a suite of you know, benefits such as you know, social, ecological, and discursive policy outcomes. And so growing up in Nicaragua at the time, um, you can imagine a child in a post-Civil War country, there was nothing to do, there was no, there was access to nothing. <laughs> You're, you know, we're starting to rebuild the country. My mom, my mom is American. She remembers like, you know, with the ice cream, like even having an ice cream or go to a park was a difficult thing to do. And so I grew up swimming basically uh, in this 
uh, freshwater lagoon that you see here, and that had a huge impact. You know, the access to that freshwater lagoon had an enormous impact in my life. Um, and you know, not surprisingly, I've been studying uh, reforms and power policy through the lenses of water uh, for now to be 15 years. So <laughs> fast forward a few years. Um, when I was in South Africa doing my master's thesis, um, I had the opportunity to, I, I won this award from the European Commission and I had the opportunity to do my master's in uh, France and in the Netherlands and I chose to go to South Africa because at the time, you know, after Nelson Mandela was president and there was this whole reconstitution of the country, um, there, were, there was this vision, this effort from a legal perspective, uh, but also from all aspects of life to redress uh, the apartheid, the, the, the effects of the apartheid regime. And so I took this picture in 2010, actually, oh my God. Um, and what you're seeing here is the legacy in a way, in a very tangible way uh, of the apartheid regime and the efforts to segregate communities. So on, the, on one side, you're seeing uh, the fields of a, uh, a uh, white African air descendant commercial farmer uh, separate, and then you see a ditch, right? You see a ditch, there's actually a ditch that they digged, and when I was there, uh, you know, 20 years after the, con the new constitution was signed, they were still maintaining, right? Actively maintaining that ditch to separate uh, from what it was back in the apartheid regime, a Batistan, a form, you know, a, a former, like the equivalent of what we see today, you know, the reservation efforts that we've seen in the US. In South Africa, there was this idea that, you know, segregation was also through land and water, of course. So there were these areas called Batustans where African, uh, where black Africans were, you know, put in to live, basically. So when I was in South Africa, you know, one of the lessons for my life and for my academic career was that the redistribution of resources, uh, allocating, you know, people of color or black Africans or disenfranchised communities into existing institutions, just coming and saying, you know, well now we're gonna, we have this multi, you know, collaborative platform and we're gonna, get, we're gonna add you uh, to those spaces. Um, what I learned is that that was not effective and that empowerment is more complex. Uh, just giving land to people, now, now ha they have some sort of representation in you know, local water agencies, was not doing the actual work of empowering you know, previously disenfran disenfranchised communities. And so what this meant for me was that we have, you know, and this is part of my work today, um, I am interested and I look at all of these different mechanisms that you see in the middle. What are the processes and the participation strategies that different actors use on, on different sides to engage in policy processes and shape the decisions that, you know, that, that are taken um, to shape or define policy outputs and therefore the distribution of, you know, who gets what, who gets included, you know, and who bears the burden. And in the case of when we think about climate and environmental justice, you know, we can think about all the, uh, you know, burdens, but also the benefits, right, that accrue from certain policies when they, 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 you know, they take place. So situating, you know, the complexity of what we see in social ecological systems, you know, we have, you know, multiple resource units who compose very complex resource systems on one side, this is the ecological side, and on the other side we have, you know, a lot of different users who compose you know, and have different interactions at multiple levels, some of them overlapping in multiple policy processes. So if you, if when we think about change and the different things that, you know, were, have been discussed already, you know, thinking about where are the lever points, right? Where are the lever points within this complexity uh, that we can effectuate to, you know, move forward social environmental change? That's kind of what I'm, I'm interested in doing. Um, and to wrap it up, I just wanna say one of the lessons um, we've learned is that things are not static, right? Uh, power and inequality uh, and how they interact in policy processes as they relate to social ecological systems uh, can go multiple ways, right? They, there's no 
there's no like A plus B equals C. And sometimes we have those and then there's like feedback loops that, um, you know, feedback to the system. And when we, especially when we're trying to reorganize, uh, you know, resources or re we're thinking about the redistribution or reorganization, restructuring of the distribution of resources and representation in existing institutions and how they can effectively, you know, organize governance for everyone, right? So I'm gonna leave it at that. Um, I hope that gives you an overview of who I am and what I'm, what's my mission here at DU. Linda has me next. I didn't make a slideshow, it's not my style, but mm -hmm. my name is Ian Thomas Tafoya, and if you were here earlier, I did a little bit of a teaching just talking about who my company is, Green Latinos, fighting for environmental justice, environmental liberation, uh, outdoor equity by organizing, empowering, and networking community members across the state and certainly across the United States. Uh, as we were preparing for this part of the conversation, you know, my, what I wanted to talk to people today about is how I firmly believe in my life experience that injustice thrives in the borderlands and the frontera of responsibility between government agencies in between localities and counties or two cities that are adjacent to each other or certainly with two countries. So the, you know, what Dr. Kim was saying there in the beginning really struck me, my big takeaway from what she was saying is, she's right, you don't have to have status to be able to be engaged in the political process. Hands down, you don't. There's nothing that says you have to be uh, an adult either. You can be a minor and a citizen with status in this country and still be able to participate in the political process. None of that ever stops you from making a phone call. None of that stops you from knocking a door. None of that stops you from protesting. None of that stops you from planting a seed. And I think that I'm really excited to hear more about your book tomorrow and read it myself. I think um, having been embedded in a mixed Asian, Latino, white community in West Denver, I definitely saw a lot of connections between what you're talking about there. So let's talk about, we'll start at the federal level, I think, or the international level. Right, and this injustice that's thriving on the borders, um, and how it's connected in particular to environmental justice, climate justice. A couple pieces here. So the long-term drug war, and particularly in Colombia and many of the Central American countries, has resulted in the United States government dumping a ridiculous amount of pesticides into fields and causing a lot of harm for people, which has made their fields not really growable. And so when people are looking for opportunity, many of them come to the United States I had the opportunity just in December to go to Colombia where I had these very direct conversations with people about um, the impact um, of the United States dumping pesticides into their communities. And the fact is they can't even get a visa to come visit here and spend their money here, despite the fact that they export such a great amount of food to us. So this made me take a look at Mexico, where many of the Mexican immigrants from Durango, Zacatecas, from northern uh, Mexico began migrating here in the 90s. Um, why? Because of drought, right? Again, if you can't grow food and you're gonna move on for better opportunities for your livelihood. And what we've seen here is that we have a drought here as well. And so these individuals who have the skill set to grow food are now often building and constructing um, the buildings that are in our communities. And they are being exposed to outdoor temperatures, many of the other kinds of things that you would experience as outdoor workers. Um, and if we really wanna look at the disparity between the dialogue about who is welcome and who is not, as we have community members who are part of North American free trade, who are part and allies with us, who are unable to get the visas to come to our country um, to do work with our country. And there's this public outcry right now for people from Ukraine to be able to come almost immediately. Those are the kind of things I think our community sees. And I wanna be clear, I don't think that my community feels that others shouldn't be welcomed. It's not about being more exclusionary. It's about having more openness to bringing in individuals and having equality in the system and in the political dialogue. Okay, so that's government to government. Now, I think maybe it might be good for us to, too, to talk a little bit. Who knows that about the Indian Relocation Act? Does anyone know about that? If you're not familiar with the Indian Relocation Act, it was probably one of the uh, last policies, though, certainly not the last, to try to continue genocide and the disruption of indigenous values and tribal stewardship and self-determination in the United States. Um, if you really look back to the Native American Wars, 
um, the genocidal wars. Mm -hmm. And I said this earlier in my presentation, but my grandfather was one of 3,000 people from our tribe that was still alive, right, in the turn of the century. And um, that was through concerted efforts to starve out, to smoke out, to flush out, and choke out people. And when you look at um, our communities, <laughs> we had been stewards of the land, right, growing the food. Then we were divested of the land, and many of us became farm workers. Then we became the poisoned farm workers, and then they would become the displaced farm workers into urban cores where they're also subjected to pollution. It's really sad to see. But, you know, 1934, just a quick history for you, 1934. Now they signed all these treaties that made all these promises. The government was under delivering on the things that they promised for self-determination. So they said, all right, well, give up your traditional form of governments and reorganize in 1934. And that didn't work. Uh, well, it worked in destroying the local governments um, and much of the tribal sovereignty in many ways, but it didn't result in distinguishing the full identity of indigenous peoples. So then they came back and they tried to disrupt our land by saying, all right, you all believe in collective land ownership and stewardship. We got to inject individuality into your communities, right? So they call that the allotment period, where they gave you the opportunity to break up the land and do with it as you wished. So that has resulted in what is basically a checkered board of land that's now been sold by people in the past and still controlled by tribal governments. And so you have this interspersed regulation between states, federal governments. Well, fast forward to the point in which they're under-resourcing us and they got to a point in the 1980s where they said, you know what would be really good for you all? If you just moved into a town, why don't you just come move to a city and fully assimilate, live the American dream? That's the path for you. And so they offered a lot of resources and Denver was one of those cities. And that's why you'll see such a large representation of tribal peoples here in, in Denver, Colorado, why we have the large powwows here. Um, and beyond the fact, which I mentioned earlier, was about being the headwater state, right? Water, of course, not knowing any of those boundaries and traveling. If the water was sourced here in Colorado, even if you lived in Arizona or you lived in Baja, California, you had a direct connection to Colorado. And that's why there are so many tribes that continue to travel through and call Denver home. But I just think that that's really important for you to understand that there are many tribal peoples who struggle with accessing resources and intergovernment interactions. And Denver is a hub for that um, because of the relocation cities. Now, when you start talking about the federal government and the regulation of toxics, um, in particular, the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, they kind of pick and choose when they want to enforce that stuff. And we've had some success in forcing the government to do the right thing or make progress towards it. Most recently, if you heard, uh, for the first time in, since 1999, the local environmental protection agency rejected the Suncor permit, the first air permit, Title V technicality, that's what it's called, permit, since 1999. It's huge. A lot of advocacy from the community. But what we saw in the past and what we continue to see is that they, they choose when they the boss. And when they don't want to be... It's kind of like, I don't know, maybe you see this in a family sometimes where one person's always laying down the hammer and the other person doesn't want to do it. That's what the government's about. And the industry the whole time is getting away with murder because of it, right? Slow toxic murder or acute murder for people when they're exposed to acute high levels of pollution. But they point fingers at each other like this. And they're like, well, we're like, we have an air problem. And they're like, well, that's really the state's problem. And you're like, okay, state, what are you going to do about it? They're like, that's the federal people's problem, actually. And so it really becomes this whack-a-mole of communities making an effort on these borderlands of jurisdiction to try to do something about it. Now, this is actually replicated at a lower level, where you have localities who want to be empowered to take on, on uh, toxics, toxic air pollution, what's coming into our communities. And I'm going to use Suncor as another example, because you have Commerce City, where the polluter is, Denver, where the people are being impacted, and so you go complain to your local leaders, and they're like, well, that's not technically in our jurisdiction. And that's when they all come together and try to go to the state, and they all continue to pass the buck. It is an incredibly challenging thing about borderlands. And that is even reflected on a smaller level in localities. So when you start talking about zoning and areas which are mixed use versus industrial versus industry, and now we're starting to see that these formerly industrial areas are becoming more residential and the property values are worth a lot. So there's a lot of incentive for modern day redlining, which is to pack hundreds of people into affordable housing into dangerous areas. It's happening at the borderlands. This interaction between industry and zoning and residential zoning. 
So, I, you know, what I really want you to take away is that it can be challenging to figure out who has the jurisdiction to do the right thing. And it can be challenging to force these actors to collaborate and work together. And that goes back to what you hear, um, especially from Dr. Kim, of why people are frustrated and they don't want to participate in the system at all. Right? They feel like they're more empowered to make change in their lives by doing the right thing themselves. And I believe in direct action and direct service. I do a fair amount of direct service with the unhoused, directly providing them drinking water. Why? Because the government is pointing fingers at each other. And meanwhile, there are people who are not receiving the desperate goods that are human rights for individuals. So in this work, we will, you will often see the industry loving to play each other off us against each other on these borderlands. That's where the rise of nationalism has come in, to make you feel different than the other human being that's next to you. I think it's in particularly true with the environmental racism that occurred in this community. And I'm going to close by just giving you one example of this that we've been able to heal and work beyond. But when they were coming to widen I-70, which was a community that I grew up in, there were I was representing an organization called the Colorado Latino Forum. And we're the only organization that said, no highway widening is in any Latino community. But so often they make you feel like it's a devil's choice. Either they were going to widen it in Commerce City or they're going to widen it in Denver. And what did you have? People capitalizing on the construction and the development, the industry, and community members at each other's throats about who deserved toxics in their community. Nobody deserves toxics in their community. And so we have worked beyond that, and myself included, to heal and to bring us together to fight Suncor to find targets to fight together, and to put those leaders all in the same room and say you can't pass the buck when we're all looking at you at the same time, right? And we are making some progress on that. But I just want you to be acutely aware, again, that that injustice thrives at many levels. And you, if you're aware of it, you can stop it from taking control of you and your narrative. One thing I just want to say really quickly in listening to all the panelists is you can see here how race and racism has been central to each of these forms of environmental destruction or pollution, right? Like, so you have the example of apartheid in South Africa, right? How important it was to make sure that land and the best land, right, was given to the white South Africans, right? Um, and that you deprive the black Africans of, you know, being able to have the best land or the right side of the land, quote unquote, the right side of the tracks. And, you know, similarly, like Ian's talking about widening of freeways, right? And one of the issues, because I was telling you about all the diesel pollution that comes from moving goods, right? So um, I'll probably show a picture of it later, but um, I didn't get to elaborate on it because I, did, I didn't want to take up too much time, but everything you and I buy in stores, right, or at Costco or you know, at the car dealership or electronic stores, right? All of that has, most of it has to be shipped here, okay? Because we're no longer a manufacturing economy. We decided in the 70s and 80s, you know, yeah, we were once a manufacturing economy, we made stuff here, but we're gonna ship all that out to the global south, um, you know, the quote unquote third world so that we can get the cheapest labor possible that is most exploited, right? And so, Pretty much everything that you and I buy, or most of it, has to be made in China or other manufacturing countries, and then it's brought here on a cargo container, right? Those big ships, right? Sometimes you might have seen like port cities, right? They have all those rectangular containers of different colors. They say China shipping, Hanguk, like, you know, where a lot of the manufacturing is happening. And those ships run on diesel. Then those goods have to be transported to, you know, the Costco's, Best Buy's, whatever, right, of the nation. And so they're put on these big Mack trucks and they're put on these big trains and they, you know, rumble up the freeway, they rumble through the, ra the rail yards throughout the country, right? So some of the stuff you guys buy in Denver, a lot of it actually came through the port of Los Angeles and Long Beach, which is the port that the AAPI and Latina immigrant women live right next to, right? Um, those trucks, those trains all run on diesel, okay? Um, and so there was this fight um, because the state government wanted to widen the 710 freeway, which is one of the major freeways that takes all those goods from the port in LA and Long Beach to the rest of the country, right? 
And one of the reasons why uh, freeways are so significant is that we actually have to see those as some of the most racist monuments in our country. So when we think of racist monuments, what do we think of? We think of Confederate you know, soldiers and officers, right? But freeways are among the most racist monuments, okay? Because who wants a freeway running through their community, right? Who wants a freeway splitting their community and forcing people to move, right? Displacing people, right? Who wants a freeway that causes not just incredible asthma and lung disease and cancer from all the diesel, but it's dangerous, right? It's usually placed really close to homes and schools where children are trying to learn, right? There's oil slick, there's noise pollution, there's construction pollution, there's all the emissions from concrete, right? So, um, you know, that was one of the major fights. And again, racism is usually the determinant of where they decide to place these freeways or widen these freeways, because it's almost always in a community of color, even if the community of color is middle class. So that's, you know, what these researchers have often found is that, holy smokes, right? Um, race is often more of a determining factor than uh, income level or class in terms of where they're gonna put that freeway or widen it, where they're gonna put that toxic emitter, right? The trash incinerator or the oil pipeline, whatever it might be, right? And so I think all these different ways that, you know, indigenous peoples, right? You can't understand the history and the current struggles of indigenous peoples without understanding how environmental racism was at the center of settler colonization, right? Of, you know, ensuring that, you know, the lands that they were on were not the best lands or that, you know, the lands are contaminated, right? That you divorce the people from the actual cultural collective community and connection to the land, right? So I just want us to really be attentive in listening to all three people's, you know, uh, research projects or the activist work that they do, professional work that they do, in seeing how we really cannot ever understand uh, racism or white American supremacy without centering the environmental justice struggle. It's kind of interesting because they actually built a playground on top of this last highway they got in, in the oh, neighborhood. Even better. Right? <laughs> and it was conveniently 10 feet short of requiring the kind of venting stacks that would push the pollution further away. Mm -hmm. And I think what's been really challenging to see, again, is 10 story, 8 story buildings being built literally abutting highways when the evidence is so clear about the diesel death zones that you're describing. So if it's within 2,000 feet, is that really the place that we should zone 200 units, 300 units? And we end up paying for it on the other end. Mm -hmm. uh, and in particular, when you factor in all the other racist issues that, you're ta that we could talk about, like wage gap, an ability to professionally develop. And so then perhaps you're now on the kind of assistance like Medicaid and so we're paying for it on the other end anyways. Um, I just want to add something. Um, well, we, when you were talking, Nadia, one of the things that comes to mind, and I'm teaching EJ right now for grad and grad undergrad, and this week, with some, of, some of my students are here, uh, we, you know, it was race. We, we, we just yeah. had race as a week. Next week is gender. But um, when I hear you talking about um, these things, what uh, in my scientist or scholar mind, the way I think about the things that you're describing, and it's very tangible. Yeah. We're talking about very tangible expressions of environmental ra racism that we can see basically cemented through infrastructure, right? Um, in my work, um, I am after the intangibles yeah. in a way which are, are, they're very difficult to expose and uncover. and. I didn't also, I didn't go on with my presentation because I didn't want to take so much time, but uh, today I wanted to share like this processes of municipal underbounding. So historically, and you know, we're both scholars in California, um, in the Central Valley of California, and this is happening everywhere, and a lot of it happens in the South as well, where, you know, because we had Jim Crow and, you know, all these regulatory laws that enforce, but de facto we had segregation, because we continue to build on those existing institutions. To this day, you know, I have a, I have a paper that's coming up right now uh, on you know, research that I did in 2015, to, from 2015 to 2017, where you know, cities and counties to this day are actively 
building on these laws um, to continue to do the work of you know, segregation. Basically, in the case of water, which is what I study, um, you know, refusing, basically, it, 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 we can call it an apathy or outright refusal of uh, extension of basic human rights services, such as access to natural resources, in this case, a basic resource as like water. Um, and so we see the configuration of cities, sometimes even going around areas of community of color. And if you think about it in, in an engineering perspective, like infrastructure perspective, you know, when you are designing this type of things of extension of services, you know, in an engineering mind, what you're thinking about is what is the shortest path from point A to B and the cheapest one? And we see actively these efforts of going around cities to prevent the annexation of what they call, and I quote in their documents, um, you know, underserving communities, like non viable communities, which is the same language that we see if you go a little bit back in history in this country. Same language, like non viable communities, underserving communities. So we're, we're talking about questions of citizenship, right? Uh, you were talking about borderlands and the creation of this borderlands. Um, so I just wanted to bring, like, you know, environmental justice are very visible things that we can see through infrastructure. Like, it really struck me, like, the monument, ra the racist monuments, right? But they're also, um, if you study processes and poli you know, political processes or, po or public processes, there are also these very active strategies that today, you know, our public agencies, which are, you know, our government, which is supposed to be a neutral arms of implementation and, you know, providing services to everyone. To this day, they actively use the playbook of segregation <laughs> and racism to continue and furthering, uh, you know, environmental racism today. You know, we're... I think we also see it even for those that are active who struggle to make the connection or are exhausted in showing up in an advocacy sense. And it comes back to, for those who weren't here earlier, I'm on a statewide tour that we're calling the Take on Toxics Tour. And it's about uniting efforts around air, water, and soil pollution. If you're not experiencing a cumulative pollution issue like some communities in North Denver, which ostensibly is like a port, same with Pueblo, Colorado. They, they operate like ports with massive amounts of goods and fluxing and then serving out. So I hear where she's coming from. But if you live in a community where perhaps your issue is a water contamination issue and you don't really feel like you have an air pollution issue, that's a good thing for you that you're not experiencing more than one form of it, but we're more powerful together. And so the, the fact of this tour is really trying to break down those barriers even in policy for people to see the interconnected nature of that. And I do a lot of this work, like I say, with environmental groups is just an example. If, you form, if you're gonna form a new student group or a new political group and you choose citizens for climate action or citizens for this, you are automatically removing individuals who will probably want to operate and work with you because they're impacted, because they may not have status. You don't have to have status, again, I'll say it again, you don't have to have status to make change in your community you certainly don't have to have status to take on any sort of toxics and self-defense for your own life and your family. Questions, it's like 1.36. Anything, clarification, <laughs> if you want more info. Thank you. Um, Ian, you mentioned modern day redlining, and for some reason that's a new term to me. Um, will you talk more about what that is and how it impacts people? I'm sorry if that's a dumb question. Well, I don't, I don't think it's a technical term that I've, uh, um, that I've ever read in a, in a book or in theory. It's something that's been in my testimony as of late because we, we know about historic redlining where literally in the zoning code you weren't able to own except in these blocks, X, Y, and Z. The modern day redlining again that I see is that we have struggled 
In particular, with a concept called inclusionary housing, we finally, after 20 years, have passed a law. For those who don't know what inclusionary housing, it means if you're going to build a big building, you got to include some different, varied kinds of affordable housing into a, into a building. And when we organized people to testify on it, there were people at all ranges, right, that were showing up. And I've had some recent publications about this, like in the newspaper, of just calling out that if you don't build two and three bedroom buildings, then we're not going to be advancing what new what families look like or helping support families up in our community. But also, their entire community, so area median income, right? It's a scientific poli-sci term, public policy term. Basically, if you make X amount of dollars compared to everybody else in your community, you fit somewhere on the scale. They don't want to pass any sort of that creation for people who make less than 60% AMI. But their entire communities, like Louisville, Area, Sponsia, West Denver, who their average median income is less than that. So what you're saying to me is that a building that perhaps is constructed in a safe location, even though we fought for inclusionary housing, does not welcome your community into it, does not create space for you. And they say as a result, that can be picked up by the, afford the nonprofit housing developers. Well, this is the modern day redlining is that because we don't set up a system that makes it easier for affordable housing projects or restrict them to be constructed in a place that we know is toxic, that is where they go. And so for me, it's modern day redlining because those of the lowest means, which are correlated to race, are now in places that are dangerous. And so redlining in the past was a segregational piece that also put people next to toxics then, and most certainly puts people next to toxics now because we know the science. Thank you. I think the important aspect too to redlining historically, which happens in you know ongoing ways today, is that the federal government would deny people um, the ability to get a home loan, right? Um, if they came from or uh, wanted to buy in a redlined community, which was basically code for, and it wasn't even that coded, but it was coded for these are communities of non-white people, right? And their communities are non-viable, like <laughs> connected to what you know you were saying, uh, because they're low income, there's a high rate of crime, you know, um, they're dirty, polluted, right? And so we have to also understand that, um, as Ian is pointing out, that housing justice is an environmental justice issue, okay? Because, you know. The definition of environmental justice is that everybody has the right to live, play, work, go to school, and worship in communities without ever having to face disproportional environmental hazards, okay, and illness as a result, okay? If you don't have housing protection, housing justice, housing guarantees, then you're not able to experience environmental justice. And given the history, and as we know today, it's often based on race, income, et cetera, that people are not giving hou given housing security um, and that they're, they end up living next to all these sources of pollution and various others that we've been talking about. You know, there, there's also another, I wouldn't necessarily, this is, could be included if you were to ever write a paper about this, I don't know, but it's an issue that I hear a lot in rural Colorado in particular, where conservation easements, which are tax write-offs and an intent to keep environmental places protected for some have actually, again, restricted land values. And so what you'll see, and we can use the Roaring Fork Valley from Aspen all the way down to Glenwood and then out towards the Grand Valley and Rifle is a perfect example of where this is brokered by my members, where people are uncompensated riding two hours on a bus. If, if they're fortunate enough to have a car, they're doing it in a car. Uh, to go to work, so if you're four hours a day to make ends meet, to live in a place where you're still housing burdened, and why is that happening? Because the local zoning codes have restricted growth in a way that is meant to protect environmentalism, or is that also a code word for you're not welcome here? It's a fascinating dialogue. I literally have members in Green Latinos who write conservation easements for a living, and I have members who work on the other side of it, and we're really interested in actually having a panel to have this conversation, but you know that doesn't necessarily mean that you're in a toxic situation, but it certainly 
is taking your time away from, you know, your ability to live and commute and work near your home. Hi, thank you. This has been really engaging. Um, I had a question about um, the ways that you are seeing or the ways that you're thinking about how COVID-19 is shifting um, these like challenges and, and coalitions. Um, so in particular, I'm thinking about the ways that people moved out of cities, right? And moved into these more like resort community, right? The, peop right, the people who could vacation away from, from urban areas and how that's shifting um, community resources and if anybody has any thoughts around that. No, that's an excellent question. And I'm so glad you brought this up because we do need to make a much stronger connection between why certain communities are the ones disproportionately dying, right, from COVID-19 in comparison to others. And that's definitely um, putting environmental racism and classism at the center, right? Um, I do think that what the COVID-19 pandemic has done has definitely allowed for the exacerbation of the hierarchies and the injustice, right? Because just as you said, if you have the funds and you have the mobility, you just leave, right? Or you decide, oh, I can't stand this dense, tighter space, urban living. I'm gonna go buy a house out in the suburbs or in a nicer pastoral area, whatever, whatever, right? Um, and it just continues to perpetuate that same death and dying rate that's completely skewed and disproportionate, right? Towards uh, people of color, low-income people. Um, I think what's interesting is that because we haven't made enough of this connection yet between the pandemic and uh, environmental injustices, that even for the environmental justice activists themselves, and I definitely spoke with them and followed up with them after the pandemic, you know, when isolation kind of calmed down a little bit. Um, and, and there's a, like a whole different set of challenges that I think are being presented. So one of them is that in the predominantly working class Latinx community of Wilmington, uh, West Long Beach, the, it's kind of like the South Bay of LA, really close to the port where all that pollution is coming from and the freeways and the train yards are all located right near their neighborhoods, right? And the activists are kind of running into trouble and, and, and struggling because, you know, some of the members of the community um, didn't, I mean, and this kind of makes sense, right? They're so distrusting of the government and what the government is gonna do to them. Mind you, a government that has sought to surveil, detain, imprison, deport, right? And, and has you know, spewed out this incredibly racist nationalist rhetoric, rhetoric of your racist, your MS, your rapist, sorry, not racist. Your rapist, your MS-13, um, you know, you come from S-hole countries, right? And so many of them have been very distrusting of the vaccine because they're so distrusting of the national federal level government. And so many of them have not wanted to take it. Some of them think, oh my gosh, they might kill me, right? I mean, I don't know what they're doing to me in the hospital. So, I mean, that is the fault of the state, right? <laughs> but then it causes these issues, you know, in terms of uh, higher, not getting higher vaccination rates. I mean, other reasons have been, um, you know, religious or, or religious based. And so in some ways, the activists have kind of had to shift, they've had to shift their focus a little bit more to try to uh, convince people to get vaccinated, right? Um, and slowly but surely, I think they're trying to make connections between why you have gotten, so many of you have gotten so sick from COVID and having lung problems, right? Already like, um, you know, lungs that are impacted or hurt by environmental pollution. Um, but I, I don't think, in my discussions with them, I don't think they feel like they've gotten to a level where they're really happy with that activism and, and the sense that like we've really made that clear and we've made that connection. Um, but one thing that I do note and I thought was really striking, and I, I'm gonna talk about this in my, um, my speech in F3, is that you know to address what everyone on this panel has been saying, which is that there is neglect and, and violent neglect that comes from the state and corporations and banks, right? 
that these communities have really decided, especially because many of them are women and mother led, that they've decided to form their own emotional support networks because they really feel like what the state and the corporations are doing is a form of emotional violence, right? Essentially saying, we don't care. We don't care about you, you know? You guys can die slow, quiet deaths. You know, they know. They know they're killing the residents, right? What are they doing about it, right? Um, and another thing that happens is there's a lot of emotional manipulation as like these power plays that come from corporations. So for example, like Valero Oil, BP Arco Oil, um, you know, they will put lots of money into the local public schools. They will give lots of funds to the local police department. They'll give lots of funds to the local hospitals, local clinics, right? So that you cannot fight back against big oil in your community, right? Because if you do, they're gonna pull those funds, right? So even high schoolers, middle schoolers, teachers who try to organize against oil pollution and, and all this environmental racism and classism, they get disciplined and punished by their own principals or their own staff, right? No, kick out that environmental justice group. They'll dissolve environmental justice groups at the youth organizing level in high school because they're like, then we're gonna lose our funding, right? So there's all that emotional violence and neglect that happens, right, from the top down. And so what these activists, women and mother-led oftentimes have done is they've decided to form these emotional support networks to care for one another's bodies, you know, the stress, the anxiety, the depression, right, that comes with all the stressors of being sickened and your children being sickened, being in murder deaths and killed, right? And what they've done is they've transplanted those same emotional networks in order to deal with the stressors and anxiety around COVID, which I thought was so fascinating. They're able to take this like pre-existing organizing tool and transplant it to deal with everybody's stress about COVID and Zoom school and everything else. And people getting sick and being forced to work even though they have COVID themselves, no protection, no mask, no healthcare, very similar environmental justice group. Well, I had a couple thoughts to your question. One, I always thought it was pretty subversive the way the government made people essentially sacrificable. And there were a lot in my community who were like actually proud that they were essential workers, but like it's messed up because everyone else is getting to stay at home and they were essentially going out there to be sacrificed, right? So that's just an interesting one. I will say, po you know, we're not post COVID yet, but the world is opening up and I will say that Folks with privilege have seen the bullshit too, and they recognize it. And it's actually empowered our organizing with other people who have had the privilege to organize for a long time, and people who are willing to take half solutions as incremental change, or more willing to be on the line with us. I think they're, we are more empowered as leaders, environmental justice leaders, to lead coalitions right now. And I think that a lot of us, we weren't just environmental justice leaders, right? We were caring for our elders and we are fighting for financial literacy, right? Like it's just one of the many sports that we have to play from a policy perspective for our communities. And I think I personally feel like I came out a stronger leader from COVID, right? So if the, those, especially the youth, because the elders had to stay at home. So there was this baton passing that happened, right? Of, of people having to step up into that void. And I think that that's been a really amazing factor in the change is seeing leaders come forward and emerge, and you're seeing them run for office even. There are people who say, well, what have you been doing for the last 10 years? Well, guess what they did the last two years? They were out there in the streets. They were feeding the people. They were for providing the solutions, you know? And so I think that that dynamic has changed some. And I think, and particularly for young people again, because I never saw so many young people actually out there using their hands to try to do the work. I, my name is Arne Menconi, and I'm not from Aspen. I'm from Carbondale, which is uh, like Brooklyn, but without all the people. Um, I, um, I used to be a former Eagle County commissioner and wrote some of the most strictest affordable housing regulations that the state had ever seen, so I'd <coughs> love to help out with that. I'd also uh, like to say Ian and I were arrested two years ago at the state capitol for protesting the governor and the state legislators uh, and 
38 of us were thrown in jail overnight. I had been arrested five times before that in D.C. and never been thrown in jail overnight. But what I'll say this, and part, the reason, uh, part of the reason I came here is, uh, number one, I think Ian is one of, Denver, one of Colorado's most important leaders in this movement and is fighting tirelessly every day. The other thing is because I'm a provocateur, and I would say that we have a Democratic governor, a Democratic legislators, and they have yet to introduce any kind of legislation that would ratchet down greenhouse gas effects. Now, I've talked to Bill McKibben about this, AOC, um, Ralph Nader, everyone. This isn't rocket science. You know, We live in an oil and gas state, and we have Democrats who are giving us virtue signaling lip service, angry speeches, yet they have yet to introduce something called a bill, and lawmakers' jobs are to write laws to outlaw the problem. So an example is Emily Sirota, whose husband's David Sirota, who did the movie Don't Look Up, has yet to introduce any kind of real meaningful legislation. And so I say this as um, a man who doesn't have hope, I have kids, you know, we know that the IPCC report says there's seven years left. We know that Colorado is one of the only states in the country that has a Democratic governor, Senate, and House. And I can say this, you guys are the most powerful voices. You go to, the, I, I graduated DU's MBA program so I could know how the enemy thinks and talk their language and be Robin Hood, you know. You go into the, into the state capitol I can't anymore. Um, I'm a pr I, I've kind of like overspent my welcome there, but they will listen, and I guarantee you they will not have an answer as to why not they're putting forward uh, some kind of bill that's meaningful for this state. Thanks. I mean, is your question there why there's no courage for action? I mean. who are public servants. And they're telling us to always wait and behave. And they're giving us a half of loaf on different things. And you and I talked about this beforehand. The legislation that they do put up there are those nice things that would have been phenomenal 10 years ago. And it's also saying, this is what we can do. Well, until they present something, which they did last year, Senate Bill 200, but the governor threatened to veto it. And he said in the news, the free market uh, will get us to where we need to go. And Medea made a very important point when we were talking. They pass the regulations or the rules, and then they don't enforce them. So, but I still say we still have to keep moving and pushing. And I would be with anyone who wants to occupy the Capitol for a week or whatever in order to turn on the light and make the cockroaches run so that people will write about the real issues that we need to be talking about. Well, if it makes you feel any better, we chanted on Thursday louder than when we went to jail, and they didn't do shit to us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and we advanced our air toxics legislation. So, you know, things may be ch ch changing, Arn. But, you know, I think what, what, you know, I said this in my speech earlier, that... There's a fourth branch of government, that's us. And if you look at some of the most prolific policy that's been passed either locally or at the state level, we could run a ballot initiative, we could do it ourselves. You know? So for all the time you could do sitting in a night in jail, you could probably knock 500 doors with one person. So there is still hope. And you know, we're gonna have to get to work hard after this session. But this session, we're trying to take on toxics for our community. We understand climate justice. And we need to make those changes. But the toxics that have poisoned my community are our number one priority this year. Yeah, and to that I say thank you. Great effort. There are 700 bills that's proposed every year between January and May. Walk and chew gum at the same time. And there's been two or three attempts that I've been involved with with petitions for um, 
expanding fracking, curbing fracking in Colorado, and each time that it comes up to the wire, the politicians and the money gets involved and blows it. That doesn't mean that we don't stop fighting on all levels. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think you're making a really important point, too, that, and it connects to my point earlier, that both Democrats and Republicans prop up capitalism, and they prop up neoliberal racial capitalism. And so I think everyday change is really important, but I also think we really need to be thinking about how can we make systemic change, right? How can we make change that fundamentally restructures and changes our institutions um, and the way they operate? And one of the most promising things that I never thought I would see in my lifetime is like members of your generation, I'm not saying all of you are part of this, but you know, there's just members of the millennial and the Gen Z generation that are becoming more critical of you know, systems based on racism, patriarchy, right, classism, um, that includes environmental injustice, right? And so, uh, like you're saying, like we need multi-pronged solutions. And I think some of the activists that we're working with and studying are re realizing that and recognizing that. Like, we need to take care of everybody's day-to-day -day needs, be they emotional, be they physical, but we also have to be really thinking about how do we either detach from the system and make new systems, or how do we fundamentally change the existing system? I, I just wanna applaud something. Um, my environmental justice policy and practice class for undergrads, some of which are here, are ch they chose a bill, they have to choose a bill Oh, has to be environmental justice related in Colorado for the la between now and the next, the last two or three years. And so they're all like trying to do the like, groundwork of understanding, um, you know, what has happened, who are the actors, who oppose, who is in favor, like so do the stakeholder analysis and, you know, the definition of the problem and how the bill proposes to address the problems, right? Because sometimes they don't match. So I'm hoping, you know, you're here and maybe they can talk to you at some point. I'm really curious um, what bills are you working on this year? Um, I think there's like three groups that pick bills for this year. Some of them are previous years. Um, but, you know, it's, I'm not an activist, right? But that's, that's kind of like my way of intersecting myself and trying to do apply science and things, analysis that may, you know, illuminate some things or also for them to have the experience, right, of going to the Capitol and, you know, calling their senators, um, you know, their representatives and trying to do that, you know, sort of like work. With them and, you know, if you go online, check out Green Latinos, you can sign up for action alerts. Some of the bills just really quickly to run through them, making sure there's a filter in every school and child care center for water pollution banning toxic forever chemicals like PFAS from new products here in Colorado, setting up our own health-based air monitoring for toxics and standards to meet those, electrifying our school buses and other trucks, right, so that we can advance forward. Um, I'm trying to think of a couple of the other ones that are in my head. Uh, disclosing what the hell's in fracking fluid so that we can figure that one out. Um, and you know, this idea of cumulative pollution in small sources, and I used this example earlier, if every single one of these chairs was a well, each one of their emissions would be considered small pollution, and so they would get their permit. But there's clearly some sort of additive effect if you add up all of these chairs together and the toxics they're releasing. And so these are the bills that we've branded together in the Take on Toxics Tour. And I don't know if your class would indulge me, but my PR team was saying that we could maybe get everyone to yell, take on toxics, and we send it to the governor, right? Because that's the power, right? The power is the people. And we have shown by marching on his house that when we show up, he feels the pressure. And we are, as I was saying when I walked in here today, you know, I'm on my eighth city out of a 20-city tour around Colorado. Hundreds of, of Coloradans are showing up to say they want to take on toxics. And it doesn't mean that we're gonna settle for one bill when we can get all eight of them this year. And I feel for what Arne is saying about the climate crisis. And there are several other bills that do attribute climate and uh, air toxics at the same time that I could be glad to talk to you about and support them. Arne wants to ban and keep it in the ground 100%, so do I. But as I said earlier in my speech, if we're gonna make it happen, we have to make it uh, legally possible, fiscally possible, and politically possible. 
And those realities are becoming more realistic every day as the price of clean energy comes down, as we actually fully understand the cost of the healthcare part to ourselves. So do you think your class would indulge me? Would you all indulge me if we recorded a video? I just say one, two, three, take on toxics. That's another call to action. Just do it. So do you want everybody to get a little? Yeah, come a little closer. <laughs> So as, as you're doing that, So one, two, three, take on toxics, okay? One, two, three. Take on toxics. And then the next one is together we rise, okay? One, two, three. Together we rise. Right on. You like that, Governor Polis? We're coming for you. <laughs> <laughs>